We could see at a distance the president with the, you know, the Secret Service and so forth jogging. Hey, just warming up. Come on, Stretch. Come on. Come on, Stretch. Everything about it was ordinary, extremely ordinary. The president had a good jog. The plan for the day was going to be education. He was going to go to a classroom. And then we were heading back to Washington. Obviously, it didn't all end that way. The presidential motorcade heads for a local school. The morning intelligence briefing over, the threat level considered low. Before the day ends, George W. Bush will have embarked on a remarkable odyssey, unlike any previous president. For hours, the country will effectively be run from a blast-proof bunker, and America will be reeling from the most devastating attack since Pearl Harbor. At this remote military outpost known as Huntress Control, they are, as usual, scanning the skies, looking for signs of attack from the air. Cobras. Cobras in the south. It so happens that on this morning, they're conducting a major war game called Vigilant Guardian when they receive a call. It was the first thing in the morning. Uh, we were in the middle of an exercise, and uh, Boston Center gave us a call. Said, hey, we, you know, we have a hijack, a possible hijack. Uh, one of our airlines uh, might be hijacked. But since we were in the middle of an exercise, he didn't say real world or exercise. So I had to ask him, you know, is this real world or is this exercise? And he said, uh, no, no, it's, it's real. We have a no shit hijack. This is real world. Seeing the track. I'll call first Air Force. Let them know we've got potential incident. The words came up that we had a possible hijack. I directed the staff to drive Otis to battle stations. I was just standing out by the ops desk, and uh, I was told I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and they said it was a tower calling and something about a hijacking. It was American Flight 11, uh, 767 out of Boston, going to California. At the time, we ran in and got um, suited up. The two pilots, known as Duff and Nasty, scramble. They are two of only four fighter pilots on alert, covering the northeastern United States. For years, the threat of attack from the air had been considered so small that on this day, the United States mainland is being defended by just 14 planes dispersed at seven bases. We went out, we hopped in the jets, and we were ready to go stand by for a scramble order if we were going to get one. Neither pilot at this time has any reason to believe that this is other than a routine exercise. And it's just peacetime. We're not thinking anything um, real bad is going to happen out of this. It's a suspected hijacking still. Um, there's nothing confirmed. OK, battle stations is attained. American Airlines Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Looks like we've got a possible hijacking. We plan on scrambling the jets out of Otis down to military airspace south of New York. Mike gets the approval. Scramble, scramble Otis.
The two F-15 pilots are 153 miles from New York. As they take off, they are unaware that one plane has already hit the World Trade Center. Three three left out to prove. Reported. Three three. We took off, started climbing, and started hitting on two eight zero heading, basically towards New York City. I was trying to go fast to get there quickly. I was supersonic. The president's motorcade is nearing the school in Florida. One of his aides traveling with him takes a call reporting an accident in New York and asks to be kept informed. Uh, 3 4 0 11, right hand turn. As we were going down, I called for bogey dope, which was just trying to find out um, where the contact was that I was supposed to go look at. And they told me uh, he was over Kennedy. Went for a couple minutes, we waited. I looked down at the scope, it was full. We're still too far away to get a good contact on anybody. Read this word the fast way, get ready. Mad. Yes, mad. Get ready. At this stage, yes, the president knows ready. about the first plane, yes, but presumes it's an accident. A second plane, United Flight 175, hits the south tower of the World Trade Center. So I called for bogey dope again, and it was right about then where they said uh, the second aircraft has just hit the World Trade Center, uh, which was obviously a shock to both Nasty and I, because we thought there was only one aircraft out there. We were probably 70 miles or so out uh, when the second one hit, so we were just a matter of minutes away. For a long time, uh, I wondered what would have happened if we had uh, been scrambled uh, in time. We've been uh, over the flight, you know, a thousand times in our minds, and I don't know what we could have done to get there any quicker. There were about five of us standing at the back of this second grade classroom, little kids there running through their reading drills with their teacher. It seemed like the most innocent, most normal, most kind of ordinary place in the world. But I did a double take when the president's chief of staff came in, leaned over, and whispered into the president's ear. Now that's remarkable. Nobody ever interrupts the president even when he's in front of a group of six-year-olds. It just isn't done. 60 on page 153. <laughs> At the count of three, everyone should be on page 153. If the yellow paper is going His face just went, went blank, as if, oh my God. When the chief of staff whis whispers into your ear, Mr. President, a second aircraft has just hit the World Trade Center. America's under attack. I mean, I can't imagine what was going through his mind. We were to proceed directly to Manhattan instead of a combat air patrol. It was like you're in the middle of a, a bad B movie, um, flying over Central Park, chasing down airplanes and watching the towers burning and flying by the Statue of Liberty. Um, it was a very surreal kind of experience. It shouldn't have been happening. You know what's going on, but it's very hard to comprehend even though you're in the middle of it. At the school, President Bush uses a secure phone to call the vice president. He turns often to look at a TV screen and declares, we're at war, unaware a third hijacked plane is airborne. The scramble horn goes off and we get the yellow light, which is our battle stations. 
So at that point, you know, I go running out to the airplane to my assigned alert airplane, get suited up and up in the cockpit ready to start. Dean Ackman and Craig Borgstrom are the two remaining pilots on alert in the northeast. Controllers are aware of other hijacked planes. These pilots are told to fly to Washington to protect the capital, but their base is almost 200 miles away. They go active air scramble, vector 010 max speed. And then I push us over to the tower frequency and get our departure clearance, and they launch us out right away. Ready to go? Then start to. Then start to. Even while last-minute pre-launch checks are being made, the controllers learn that a third plane, American Airlines Flight 77 out of Washington, may have been hijacked. Yeah, the northeast sector's on. Okay, we gotta be getting the weapons crews back in. Look at the scramble order rolling. We'll scramble. Uh, we can carry AIM-9 heat seekers. Uh, sidewinders or the uh, AIM-7 Sparrow. Plus, we also have an internal 20-millimeter uh, Vulcan can, and we were pretty much armed with all that. We had a pretty quick response time. I believe it was four to five minutes we were airborne from that point. The pilots get a signal over the plane's transponder, a code indicating an emergency wartime situation. <laughs> President Bush decides to make his first comments. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. And I've ordered that the full resources of the federal government conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. A Secret Service agent ran out from a school and said, uh, we're under terrorist attack, we have to go now. It was a mad dash uh, motorcade out to the airport. The run itself was extremely fast. Normally, we run 40 to 50 miles an hour. On the way to the airport that day, from the school, we were running 70 to 80. The Secret Service agents all had weapon barrels that were visible. They were pointing up at the ready position um, in case they needed to be used. And I thought, that they were actually anticipating a terrorist attack on the president while we were en route. On the radar screens, an air traffic controller spots an unidentified blip. It's a plane with its transponder turned off and it's heading straight for Washington, D.C. It's flying low at 500 miles an hour. Air traffic control immediately warns the Secret Service. Here at the White House, Secret Service agents rushed into the Vice President's office. Sir, they said, we have to leave immediately. Before he could respond, they grabbed him under the arms, practically lifting the Vice President off the ground. They took him to the White House basement, along a tunnel, and to an underground bunker. <laughs> 